What does expository mean? It simply means I allow the text to speak for itself and I just point things out to you along the way and help make application points. So if I was an airline pilot, my job is to get you off the ground, to get you the altitude so you can observe and see what's going on, but ultimately I need to get you back on the ground because if I don't get you back on the ground, that's bad. So uh, what we're going to do is look at some of these things and hopefully come back on the ground. What does getting back on the ground look like? Application. Often what we like to do though with our own study is dive right into application. If you do that, you miss a lot of the scenery. Okay, if you're just focused on getting from, let's say, Dallas, Texas to LA, and you're simply focused on LA, when flying over the Grand Canyon, you're going to totally miss the Grand Canyon. And there are Grand Canyons, beautiful, spectacular passages of theology within text that if you're just simply looking for application, you miss them. And so I'm going to give you the opportunity to observe some Grand Canyons and wonderful scenery within the text. Okay? So that's what manuscript study simply is. is it's making observations, asking questions along the way, and then you head in to application. But we're going to allow the scripture to speak for itself today. We're going to be doing this within the book of Ephesians. Okay? A lot of you have study Bibles and probably have some written out history of the things that I'm going to show you right now. But Ephesians is uh, within what we call the prison epistles. Uh, the prison epistles are Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Those are known as the prison epistles written from Rome. Uh, this particular one, Ephesians, is written right around 64 AD, somewhere between 60 to 65. They can pretty much pin it down to around 64, depending on other letters within Scripture. We see uh, Paul interacting with the Ephesian church at a couple, couple different places um, within Acts. Uh, in Acts 16, this is the area that he's prohibited to go into uh, the, by the Spirit of Jesus or the Holy Spirit. But he comes back in 18 for a brief stay, and then once again in 19, and he's there for about a three-month period. In Ephesus, uh, this was a Greek culture. Uh, the primary deity in that area was Artemis, uh, and you had a lot of Artemis cults, variations of that, but that's pr the primary worship was of Artemis. Uh, this letter is written to Greek converts. We, in so many speaks, would be Greek converts. Within Hebrew, the word goi, or in Greek, ethne, guess what word comes from the word ethne? Ethnic. Ethnic, yeah. We are anything outside the Jewish uh, culture, outside the, uh, the body of Judaism, would be ethne. Okay? It's impersonal. There's no specific agendas that Paul is writing to. He's giving really a, uh, a short systematic theology of what the body of Christ should look like. Okay? And this was most likely sent along with the letter to the Colossian church and to Philemon. If you read, and I pray that you do, Colossians, you'll say, wait a minute, I just got done reading Colossians. But it was called Ephesians. It's because there's a lot of similar content between the two books. Okay? That's some general background. Uh, in your study Bibles, you probably have some more specific backgrounds given. I'm not going to ask you to read that now. But that is why, like, NIV, you know, Life Application Study Bibles are phenomenal because they give you that background. Okay, so you can read that on your own. Okay? We're going to stop there. Okay? So what I want you to do, and what we're going to jump right in, is some of you, if you don't have a problem... Take uh, using your Bibles, that's fine. I often, what I do is I print off the text I'm going to preach on or study onto a piece of paper like this. Okay? I double line it. I leave space on the side for notes. What I want you to do, whether you choose to do this in your Bibles or not, or on your paper, 
is I want you to read through the text. And as you're reading through the text, what I would suggest is that you read through it at least once without making any notation. Then read through it a second time, noting what words occur more than once, particular themes or ideas that occur more than once. You can use whatever notation you want. You can circle things, draw lines under it. Uh, I know people who love to use colored pencils. Um, I'm one of those people. Um, and I will make, you know, themes or I'll highlight specific themes. Um, I'll often do this on two or three copies of this because I'll go through and I'll mark one up and make some observations, go back uh, and make some other observations and then start pulling it together. Um, but you're not going to have time to do that. I'm going to give you time to do read through this probably three times is what it will take. Is you'll read through it, get the general sense. I would write down at the top what you think the big theme is, read through it again, highlight key themes and words that reoccur or things that jump out to you, and then read it again for confirmation. Say, yeah, that's what I think it's saying. And then we're going to come back and we're going to have the magic of the Holy Spirit where we're going to look at what those themes are. And I bet you we land on a lot of the same places. Why would it be helpful to do this kind of study, maybe on a separate sheet of paper or print out like this, versus maybe doing it within your Bible? There's more room. <laughs> There's more room, yeah. Actually, uh, they are now making wide margin Bibles, which are really cool. The only problem is, is most of them are the size of the original Bible, and they're super thick. Uh, but yeah, there's more room. Yeah. Sometimes you read something, and after you you meet in a group like this, it kind of changes your the way you see it, perceive it. So right. If I write down what I think it means now, and then after I listen to everybody else's comments, well, yeah, I'm off track there. Yeah. So. Your, that's a great point. Your theology is going to constantly be growing and, dare I say, evolving and changing. Maybe not drastically, but you're going to have different perspective on things over time. That's why you're never going to have one testimony. Your testimony is always going to be changing because you're going to be changing. And so when we view things in person versus view things in community, we begin to see different things. Yeah. Why else might it be helpful? I think along with what he just said, um, I want to be unbiased, and I already have notes in my Bible from other lessons that have been taught. So Unbiased. Excellent point. In all your Bibles, they have the chapter broken up into little subcategories with nice little headings already telling you what this is all about. Is it wrong? No. They're, those aren't wrong. It's just it does give you kind of a biased viewpoint. Uh, once again, these translations, the NIV, New American Standard, NRSV, are all great translations. They do, however, have come from, because of different publishers, come from different streams of theology. My first Bible was a Ryrie Study Bible. Ryrie comes from what is known as a dispensational viewpoint. So its interpretation and its notes is going to be from that viewpoint. Okay? Not necessarily wrong, it's just it's predisposing you to a particular vein of theology, where if you're doing it this way, you allow the text to speak for itself. Okay? Any other ideas of why this might be helpful? It allows you to mark it up a lot. You know, uh, when I was doing this and preparing for this class, you know, this is kind of what I came up with, you know. Um, when I, you know, my Bible is also marked up, but I usually typically, like I said, I make marks based upon devotion. You know, when I'm not reading for necessarily to prepare for a study, I'm doing it devotionally for my time with God. Where this, you know, this is the third sheet I had based upon numerous readings, making different notes and notata uh, notations along the way. Do I throw this away? Ooh, no, 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 no. Because eventually you're going to come back to this some, same day or someday. Um, and you're going to see that, oh, maybe, th so that's what I was thinking. Or, you know what, maybe that's a, there's a different way of looking at that, and I can make the notation on that page right next to my previous notes. This is great if you're teaching Sunday school, or if you're a small group leader or something of that nature, to do this kind of study. Okay? So, 
Often when you hear a teacher ask these questions, you think we're fishing for something. I'm not fishing for anything. This is between you and the Lord and the Scripture. So, when I ask, you know, what was to you the big idea of chapter 1, what did you, what did you come up with? What were some big themes for you? Jamie? His will. His will. Good answer. <laughs> His will. What else did we see? Salvation. Salvation. Yeah. Anybody else? A lot, a lot of praise to God. Two praise? things mainly for His glory and His grace. So praise, and I'll put over here under themes, glory and grace. And if you remember, when looking at um, Philemon uh, and Jude, often we see these openings where you know, the, the writer is you know, desiring uh, grace and peace for uh, his listeners. Okay? What else did you see? Big themes, big ideas. I wrote divine election. Divine election. I like that. That word wasn't actually in there. I know. I don't know why, where I got it. Well, it spills over. What words are in there? Chosen. Chosen. Predestined. 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 <laughs> We'll discuss that in a little bit. We don't have to be afraid of these words. We just have to interpret them within context and let them say what they're saying, not what they're not saying. Okay? Other big themes. Other big ideas? Okay. What were some words that you circled that you saw come up, and maybe some of the some of the same, but words that came up, Jamie? I saw uh, a lot of in Christ, through Christ, under Christ. Yeah. Majority of it to me seems to be speaking about God Himself, what He has done. He uses okay. He a lot. Okay. Yep. You see a lot of pronouns in this. He, in Him, His, and the way you understand it is you have to read them in context, and we'll do that in a few minutes. Uh, I did a sermon a couple years ago called Anywhere a Savior Can Go, because when uh, growing up and learning what prep, uh, prepositions were, they always told us, well, it's anywhere a cat can go, in, through, above, under. You see the same language in the very first chapter of Colossians. So if you take Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1 and lay them side by side, very similar. You see the same language. Uh -huh. Very Father uh, God-oriented. Okay? Other themes or ideas, words that popped up? Redemption. Redemption? Mm -hmm. Inheritance. Inheritance. Yeah. Okay? What else do we see? Predestined popped up a few times. <laughs> Predestined, <laughs> right. Yeah, just a few times. Yeah. Uh, revelation, enlightenment. Ooh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And wisdom. Yeah, and this, these words pop up within the context of a prayer that Paul has for the Ephesian church. Yeah. Spirit. Spirit. Okay. Okay. Excellent start. 
Yeah, so this is the way that you would start out, is making notations about these words that pop up. Words that, you know, um, that are also highlighted to you. I believe that even though you may be doing a study, a manuscript study, it doesn't negate the fact that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you during that time saying, this inheritance thing, um, I know where you're at personally. You might be in a rough place. Let me just highlight this whole theme to you about who you are and what you have in Christ. So even though you might be saying, well, I'm being studious and I'm doing manuscript study, the Holy Spirit is still, still speaking to you. Okay? All right? So some things as you're going through that you want to uh, ask yourself, once again, are words that are repeated, uh, words that stand out to you, or even those words, as we may have mentioned, that don't make sense, that often that we hear uh, you know, s spoken about in church, but we have a vague understanding about what they may mean, such as election, predestination, chosen. We assume about, and I think we do a lot of assuming, about what certain words mean, uh, but we need to take them within context. Okay? All right, so I'm going to take you through my, kind of what I was uh, observing, kind of the big theme. I'm not saying this is canonical, you know, I'm not saying this is written in stone, it's kind of what was highlighted to me. If it helps you, great, all right? So when reading through Ephesians, the major theme I had was the Father's will accomplished in and through Jesus and his church. If you look at the end of the chapter, or if you look at the beginning, it's talking about, as Jamie pointed out to us, the Father's will. We saw that it was in and through Jesus, and then it lands at the end talking about us in his church. Okay? You could have some derivation of it. I would say we all pretty much landed around the same place <clears throat> through what we just talked about. I just took a little bit more time and thought through it really hard and wrote it down. Okay? So the major theme, the Father's will accomplished in and through Jesus and His church. Okay? So the Father's will accomplished in and through uh, Jesus and His church, and this involves some sub-themes. involves our being chosen to receive an inheritance to be Jesus' Jesus's agent of redemption on earth. These are uh, some other sub-themes that we talked about that came up. It involves being chosen or this idea of predestination to receive an inheritance so that we can be God or Jesus' Jesus's agent of redemption on earth. Okay? So this is what I saw as some sub-themes. So I would say the whole big idea, and often when we read Ephesians 1, we're saying that well, you know, predestination and election is talked about a lot. I would say, personally, election predestination is only a vehicle for God to accomplish His ultimate will, and that's the redemption of all things. Okay? That's what I would say, you know, where we should place predestination and election. But ultimately, it's about the conformity of all things to God's will. Alright? Any questions about this? All right. The Father's will. Often we're asking the question, what is the Father's will? I would say the Father's will is the need to bring all things into alignment with His nature, which is holiness. So, you know, we often think of, you know, the big question, and we'll look at this in a little bit. What is God's will for my life? What is God's will? I would say ultimately in reading Scripture, God's ultimate, His ultimate will is to bring all things into alignment with His nature. You might say, but George, I thought God's will was to bring glory to Himself. I would say we're looking at two sides of the same coin. But in the redemptive story that we partake in, it's about His will to bring all things into alignment with His nature. Why is that important? Why should we care about that? Because that was God's original plan for uh, the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
And here's the rhetorical big question. Why is, why is that a problem? <laughs> what problem do we have with that? We ourselves. Sin. <laughs> ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah. That's why I said you know, the major theme is God is accomplishing this in and through Christ, payment for sin, to redeem a people for himself, the church, so then we are to participate in that redemptive plan. Okay? But it's all about bringing all things into alignment with his nature. Okay? The Father's will. In Jesus, the Father's will is redemptive. Demonstrating the qualities of love, mercy, grace, wisdom, and knowledge. In Jesus, the Father's will is redemptive. It's primarily to redeem all things. Demonstrating the qualities of love, mercy, grace, wisdom, and knowledge. Where do you, in your own personal study and understanding of Christ, where do you see these qualities coming up? in God's plan. But aren't they part of the fruit of the Spirit? Fruits of the Spirit? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. Where do you see these played out within the redemptive story of Christ? Our salvation in Christ? Christ himself. Uh-huh. Yeah. Within the person of Jesus Christ. So, we get into this uh, idea of chosen, election, predestination, and when we hear those words, maybe some of us know exactly what we believe about these things, and some of us, our heads begin to spin. And say, so I'm not sure exactly what I mean uh, or understand about this. I would say uh, the Father purposely securing, this is what I would see election as or predestination, is the Father purposely securing the accomplishment of His will through the choosing of His Son and the people, the church, to be His agents of redemption. That God's will is going to be accomplished. There's no way of getting around it. It's purposeful, it's not arbitrary through the choosing of his son, which some uh, theologians would say there is a, um, a pre-covenant in which from the very beginning of time, the Trinity had decided this is how it's going to play out and this is the role the son is going to play in this. And therefore redeem a people to be his agents of redemption. The very first time we see this being played out is in Genesis 12, where the father chooses Abram and says, I'm going to send you to a land that is not your own, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and I will make you into a great nation. That's the first time we see this redemptive plan beginning uh, to work out. His choosing is fair and impartial, not based upon merit that we can boast in. So you can't say, like many other religions, I'm going to have this sliding scale of holiness, and if I you know, tip the scale on this side, then I'm all good. Can't do that. Because within our understanding of holiness, we can never tip the scale far enough. We are always going to be in need of a Savior. It does not exclude anyone coming into grace. 1 Peter 3 and 9 says, It is the desire of the Father that all might come to a knowledge and be saved. The thing that we have the tendency to miss about the word predestination in the context is it is also largely communal, community oriented, and that he is choosing a people for himself. Okay? Any questions about that? Go ahead. It's so uh, uh, free will and predestination. Yeah. So you're, so you're saying that um, everyone is predestined to Christ. 
I would say this, and this is where I would say Scripture speaks and where Scripture is silent. I would say the context when we see the word predestined, it is always talking about the predestination of God's people towards His glory or confirming with His, with his will or with His nature. Okay? There are those who like to argue from silence, I, I think. Uh, some would go to Romans. Um, but they want to say, well, if God chose some to be you know, in glory, then he obviously chose some not to be. You can take that stance. It's been held as an orthodox uh, stance. You see it within the Westminster Confession. Um, but I would say that you might be going a step further than what I see Scripture going. Because you're arguing from a state of silence, but it's also what it's not saying. Um, so, I would say within the whole predestination, free will issue, that is going to be an issue as long as we are humans are never going to come to resolution about. I'm always going to say it's not an either or, it's a both and. Um, in the same way, it's, I would say it's looking at a different perspective of God's nature. You know, we can say... You know, if this is a marker, you know, let's say this is a marker, Sharpie, and we hold it straight up like this, we're going to say, well, it's a rectangle. But if we bend it just slightly, we're going to say, well, it's circular. And I would say, yep. It's both. So I would say how our free will and God's predestination works together, that's the mystery. That, that's one I, I can't solve for you. But I do know, based upon this passage and what it's talking about, is that we are being predestined to conformity with, with God's will or God's nature. And that he is doing that through Christ and he's choosing the church to be his redemptive agent. That's about as far as I'm able to go, really based upon <laughs> Ephesians 1. Yeah. <clears throat> I might be confused on this, but that's okay. <laughs> this is speaking been. to believers, to those who've already accepted Christ. Yeah. Isn't it talking about our destiny as believers and what we're supposed to do? Yep. It isn't talking uh, to people who haven't chosen Christ yet. This is speaking to Greek converts about what their position is in Christ, what their position is in Christ. And ultimately, what their role is as those who are in Christ. It's not speaking to non-believers. So it's not speaking to what a lot of people believe, which is that some people are chosen to be followers of Christ, and some are it's not. It's not speaking towards that at all. And I think that's I, sometimes where the church gets confused. Yeah. People get confused because they think, and I've had people of the non-church, uh, or other churches, explain to me that they thought predestination meant that there are certain people within humanity that are chosen to be Christians and not some that are not chosen. Yeah. But that's not what this is saying. This is talking about the destiny we have and the right. responsibility we have as followers of Christ. Absolutely. <laughs> I totally agree with that. So that makes it simple. Yeah. I, have, I would say we have the tendency to go down maybe a rabbit trail that isn't necessary or warranted based upon the text. Um, because, like, as you said, it's about the church and what we're called to. Um, can you take the stance and say, well, obviously, if God chose some, he chose others, you're not to be? You can. There are strong, believing, Christ-oriented believers who have held that stance. I don't necessarily agree with them, but they've held that stance. Ultimately, our responsibility, whether some are chosen and some aren't, or it's all about the church... Our responsibility is still to be agents of redemption in this world. It doesn't affect what our responsibility is. Well, so then predestination and free will are two separate things. I would say they are, once again, maybe looking at different sides of the same issue. I'm glad that you put up that um, the scripture from Peter, that it doesn't exclude anyone coming into grace. I mean, it's open for all. And I like that you pointed out, too, that, it, that it's communal, that right. it's not individual, that it, it, it's we as the church, that the church is the fulfillment of, of God's will. Yeah, and it's, 
And this is so where it takes the focus off the individual. Like, yeah. am I one that was supposed to live? Am I one that was supposed to, to die? Yeah. And this is where I would say scripture. Um, this is where I would say maybe the evangelical church has focused so much on the individual aspect of faith that we've lost the communal aspect of faith. Uh, is it wrong that we talk about salvation and taking Jesus into our heart as personal faith? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. But you know, I would say our culture has gotten so personalized, we've forgotten how that's supposed to play out within community. And Scripture, if you were to ask Jesus you know, what your personal faith looks like, he would have no idea what you're talking about so, because so much of his faith was lived out communally. Did he draw away to spend time you know, with the Father? Absolutely. It was part of his custom to do that. But the playing out of it was totally communal. And he, you know, Paul, in his letters, much like what we're going to see down the road, is focusing primarily on communal issues. What this looks like day to day. Okay? But I would say often when you're looking at the issue of predestination and election, you see it largely set within a communal context, not an individual context. Okay? And this is the part where teachers are often wishing the clock to move faster. Okay? So God's will for my life. This is the other big question. Uh, that we often uh, are asking. This is the question that I often get asked, comes up, you know, people are always saying, what's God's will for my life? Well, let's start with the general, dare I say, foundational, scriptural aspect of God's will. Ultimately, it's to be conformed to the image of Christ, which in this passage says, holy and blameless, Okay. We are to love God fully and others as ourselves. The Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? That's God's will for you. It's God's will that you go and make disciples. I don't think... Figuring out what God's will for our life is is all that complicated. If we start with the foundational aspects of what we're called to, we get caught up, I think, on splitting hairs and personalizing it quite often. We say, well, should I take this job? Shouldn't I? How do I go about determining those issues for my life, which I would call the specific or personal the first thing I do is I spend time in prayer. I journal about it. I listen. I say, hey, Lord, should I go to this land that is not my own called Beaver, Pennsylvania? What do you, you, know, what do you have to say about that? I seek wise counsel. I don't seek out the people who like to tell me what I like to hear. I seek out people who are going to tell me the truth. That's who I consider wise counsel. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, it says there'll be a time, which I think is now, where people will gather around them, you know, teachers who will tell them what their itching ears want to hear. Don't do that. Often, it's the people that you rub shoulders with, or I would say maybe who are slightly abrasive, are usually the people you should listen to. When helping uh, people determine, should I continue to date this person or not? I often say, do they challenge you as an individual, or do they just seek to try and make you happy all the time? Well, no. Sometimes we, we argue, or sometimes we disagree about stuff. I was like, good. It's often that is what is going to help push you forward as an individual. I love my wife. We get along, but if you were to set us in a room, and this has happened to us a number of times, people often will not connect us as being married because we're very different. But when I was pursuing her, I was like, I like her because she doesn't tell me I'm right all the time. She challenges me. And that's the kind of thing we need as individuals. Okay? Tell my husband that, please. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I've got you got my number in the email. You can uh, Bible study with him. <laughs> right. Circumstances. I look at the circumstances. The problem is, is we often look at the circumstances first, and we allow the circumstances to determine everything, and say, based upon these circumstances, this is how I'm going to move. Well, circumstances don't tell you everything. If I was to say, you know, okay, I'm going to go to a land that is not my own. It's called Beaver, Pennsylvania. But the housing market just went down the rabbit hole. You could use whatever word you want to use. Most people would say, then don't move. Because the housing market is terrible, you're going to lose a ton of money. But if that was the only thing I was looking at, I would have never have moved. So we often look at these first. Are they important? Absolutely they're important, but they always need to be set within context. And if these things are not in conflict with God's <coughs> general or foundational will, then you can move forward. These need to be in place, but if circumstances, wise counsel, and prayer are coming into conflict, with this, God's foundational will, then you've got an issue. Okay? And you need to start all over again by seeking God. What is His will for my life? What is His foundational will for my life? If I am, um, let's say, I struggle with uh, eating too much. And... Um, you know, I'm thinking, well, you know what? What this community really needs is maybe a bakery. I'm probably saying that's probably not a good thing to walk into. I'm being very general. We have the tendency to do that sometimes. Um, if it causes me to stumble or to sin, if it is pulling me away, it's like, okay, well, I'm going to take this job. But as far as I can tell, there's no... You know, active presence of Christ via the church in that area. I need to take a hard look and say, well, God, have you called me to be a missionary? Have you called me to be this? No, I really don't have those skills. That would probably be an area I wouldn't look to take a job then. So, you know, you want to look at what's the foundational scriptural will for your life first, and then look at these other things second. Okay. So, when looking back through this letter, and this was just a little bit of a rabbit trail, but it comes up all the time when you know, discussing God's will, is primarily this opening chapter for Ephesians is talking about God's will to redeem all things through Christ and ultimately then through the church. Okay, That's why the church is such a big deal. Because we are God's agent. We are God's body. As it, If you look here in the first chapter, in the very last verse, where it says, actually in 23, uh, 22 and 23, and God placed all things under his feet, that's Jesus' feet, and appointed him, Jesus, to be the head over everything for the church which is his body, that's Christ's body, the fullness of him who fulfills everything in every way. So, if the big theme is God accomplishing his will in and through Jesus Christ and his church, what do we do with that? Why, is that, why should that be important to us, both communally and personally? Sorry? We need to know how we're supposed to function in those places. How to function? Yeah. What was the question, George? If the big theme is God accomplishing His will through Jesus Christ and His church... <coughs> You know, to bring everything into alignment with his nature, then what, what does that mean for us, you know, as a church and as individuals? 
How does that impact the way we live? That we have to live in accordance with his will. Yeah. <laughs> Bingo. If Jesus, and this is maybe one of the words that you circled or phrases, had to work in accordance, does anybody else have the word accordance? In line with. If Jesus always worked in accordance to the Father's will, always worked in alignment with the Father's will, does that mean the church, us, gets a pass on that? No. No. The church should always be acting in accordance with his foundational purposes. If we are not doing that, then we have a very poor mission statement that needs to be reevaluated. Okay? So, yeah, we need to be working in accordance with his will. How else does this affect us? Or what do we do with this? I mean, it's having a change and get rid of things that, again, don't fit to what... Okay, so prune doing. what doesn't fit. Right. But prune dead branches. John 15, <coughs> A couple minutes ago said mission statement. It kind of uh, refocuses and uh, reminds us. Refocus and reminds. Yeah. 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 Is this a large call or a small call? If you if 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 God was handing you a priority, a list of things he wants you to accomplish, is chapter 1 a major priority or a minor priority? Major. Major priority. How would you feel if you were given maybe this happens. You're given uh, a list of things to do, and they're prioritized. Which ones are you going to do first? The first, one. the first ones. Right, absolutely. Um, is there a sense of urgency usually behind this? Yeah, usually a sense of urgency. Is there a sense of trepidation or fear maybe a little bit? Yes. But where in this passage... Do we see hope that this is possible? It says in the entire thing. Okay. Yeah, as I say, it says that he gives us the, the power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in us. Yep. And yeah. It, and it's his will. It's his will. It, it, it's going to happen with or without you. Yeah. Yeah. This blows my mind. You know, we talk about the inheritance that we have. Paul talks about the fact that we have been given, uh, we've been stamped with a seal called the Holy Spirit. But when you then begin to think that we are also given the power through the Holy Spirit, is the same power that raised Christ from the dead... That's pretty amazing. How many of us walk around with a conscious, with this on our mind, that we are walking around with the living power of the living God within us that raised Christ from the dead? Mm -hmm. We don't often, I, I don't think we often take that into account. I think we often sometimes walk around with the attitude that we're like 50 watt light bulbs with a dimmer switch. <laughs> you know? We don't often take into account this truth. This may affect how you walk in faith. Okay? Anything else that this may affect. Would should affect how the church functions. Yeah, sure. Yeah.
Yep. And that's what Martin's going to be looking at, we're both going to be looking at over the next uh, five weeks, is how this affects the church. But once again, this is largely a communal letter. Um, it's not addressing like major specific issues. It's looking at how the church is supposed to function within its community. It's looking at a church much like us in a non-believing, uh, unbelieving area. And how do we demonstrate belief in this kind of a situation? We don't have you know, uh, the statues of Artemis around, but we definitely have other idols around that our community worships uh, on a regular basis. And we're still called to walk in that. Okay. What's that? Said penguins. Penguins, Steelers, you name it. Yeah, we we are we love to make idols out of things. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. This is foundational. You know, this is about the church. It's about God accomplishing His will through the church. Well, first through Jesus, and then through the church. Okay.